So the book is called Too Much. I'd love for you to first define what is too much in the context of relationships. Well, what, why I named it that, you know, it's funny, people all have the, are responding to the title and being like, people have always told me I'm too much and blah, blah, you know, like everyone, they're like, I love the title because of this. But the lens that I'm looking at it through is when you are a high functioning codependent, there is a tendency to do too much that we are over-functioning in our relationships, which can inspire people to under-function. We are giving too much. We are even feeling too much, right? Because we are unclear about what is my responsibility and what is someone else's responsibility. You actually defined this term, high-functioning codependent, correct? Yes. I love that. I I, I coined it and trademarked it before I wrote my book. Um, Amazing. Because I, I knew, I've been doing, I've been a therapist for 27 years, you know, Jess, and it's like, I knew, like, I was like, this is a thing and there's not a name for this thing and it is torturing my clients, this condition that they have. And I know it intimately because I also had it. So I understood it. So anyway, from, my, from where I sit, codependency is being overly invested in the feeling states, the outcomes, the situations, the circumstances, the careers, the relationships, the drug addiction of the people in your life to the detriment of your own internal peace. So most of us were raised to be good girls, right? We, we ca- of course, we love the people we love. We want them to get what they want in life, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about feeling overly responsible for what is happening in the lives of other people. You know, there's a lot of, and, and wait, so let's stick with why the high functioning piece. The high functioning piece came in because I attracted all of these women into my therapy practice and into my masterminds and my groups and whatever, who were all like me, successful, high functioning, super capable, like vastly capable humans. And if I would point out, oh, hey, what you're describing, this is a codependent pattern, they would immediately reject it. They would immediately say, codependent? What? I'm not dependent on squat. Everyone's dependent on me. I'm making all the money. I'm making all the moves. I do all the emotional labor. I'm making sure that the kids have everything that they need and are where they're supposed to be. And I'm already thinking about summer camp for next summer. Like, I'm doing everything. How the hell am I possibly codependent? Which made me realize my clients didn't know what codependency was. So then I started really getting into like, okay, let me analyze these behaviors. What are the similarities? Because the the irony with high functioning codependency is that the more capable you are, the less codependency looks like codependency, but it's still codependency. And you still suffer in the same way. It's just like an invisible suffering, basically. So as soon as I added high functioning to codependency and started talking to my clients about the new definition, because it's different than the old definition, they were very caught up in the gotta be, uh, you know, enabling an alcoholic to be a codependent, right? That is an outdated, I feel like it, it just got planted in our consciousness. So how could I help my clients if they didn't see themselves and their behavioral patterns in the problem, right? They didn't, they didn't see themselves. They were like, no, it's actually my husband. It's actually my boss. It's, I'm like, no, man, it's actually you. And we can, that's good news. We can, we can change that. So that's basically the, the origin of the name itself, but what are the traits and what are the behaviors of someone who might be a high functioning codependent? Because here's the thing, this can be hard to parse out or a little bit confusing because as mothers and you as a doctor, me as a therapist, like, you know, all of these, like we're in this position in life that require us to think about other people. And yet we're perfectly raised to do this because if you think about childhood, most of us were raised and praised to become self-abandoning codependents. It's a fact, right? What did we learn? Be a good girl, turn that frown around. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Nobody was like, tell me what you really think, Terry. They were like, be a good girl, get good grades. Don't be promiscuous. Like, you know, the, the messaging was all very friggin' clear and be nice. If you can help others, you must help others. And, you know, I'm not saying I think that that is, that that's not a bad thing. Those are nice qualities. Yes. And being civic minded, sure. But it's more than that. Because it doesn't stop there. 
Because I've noticed as a pediatrician and as a parent myself, there are scenarios with our kids where it's difficult because you have to be involved, you're asked to be involved, but there's a tricky balance where you don't want to be too involved. And I think that's very applicable to the lessons that you give in too much. Yep. And so is it okay with you if I maybe run through some scenarios and see how you would handle this to avoid sure. being a high-functioning codependent? Yes. Like let me know where it's crossing the line to being too much and what would be just right? Yes, go. Okay, so for example, let's say you have a child who's having teenage drama. Mm -hmm. So they're getting into a fight with their friends or there's some disagreements. And a lot of parents, I feel like the temptation is to call the parents or call the child or involve yourself. How involved should a parent be where it's uh, appropriately supporting the child versus getting too involved? Yep. So if it's the friendship scenario with teenagers... I would talk to my kid about what's happening instead of auto advice giving, which can be a very common HFC behavior where we just immediately are like telling you exactly what you should be doing because we've got the greatest ideas, which we kind of do, but it doesn't mean we should share them. Um, I would, the first thing I would say to my kid is, all right, what do you think you should do? Tell me how you're feeling about this. Just, so let's just, let's just brainstorm it. But tell me what you think you should do because your gut instinct is really good. And I really trust that. I love that. So just an open-ended, non-judgmental, curious question. Yes. So we go from auto-advice giving to expansive questions. And listen, if, if something is getting rough, if, it's, if it gets out of control, if your child is being harmed, obviously you step in. But that's down the road, right? What our job as parents, one part of it is to teach them critical thinking, deductive reasoning, you know, ramifications for your actions, like decision making, right? And when we are so afraid to let our children make mistakes, and we are so afraid that they're not going to choose the right thing, we are squishing their creativity, their, their ability to problem solve, their ability to think in this linear way or think in this deductive reasoning type of a way. And not to mention, when you are interested in what your child thinks, no matter what age they are, you are teaching them that what they think and how they feel and what they want matters. But it's treating the child with respect in a way that you would want them to be respected in their adult relationships and the way that you expect them to respect you. I've always talked to kids in a way of like, a certain amount of respect for their autonomy, for their brain, for their ability to figure something out. It's so loving to create that open space because the most, you know, what do we say? The most expensive coin you will ever spend is your time. So you're saying to your child, this is worth talking about and I'm going to put my phone down and we're not going to have the television on and we're going to be walking outside or we'll be somewhere where you have my undivided attention. This is important because you are important, but not in the way that you are a problem that I'm fixing, in a way that I'm interested in what you think. And even if the kid says, oh, I don't know, I don't know, you just tell me. You can say, babe, I'll weigh in, but you do know. Like, let's just, let's just pretend you did know what the answer was. What would it be? Just, just, just say the first thing that comes to your mind, like teach kids how they get their own answers and that it's also okay to make a mistake. Maybe your kid says, well, I think I should punch Billy in the face. You can go, okay, I can understand that desire because Billy really acted not nice at all. So I get that. And what do you think would happen if you punch Billy in the face? Well, I'd probably get suspended. I'd probably, okay. So maybe, maybe punching Billy is not the best idea, but I do understand the desire. Um, but let's talk about maybe there's a different solution than punching Billy. Like, instead of, we don't need to overreact and freak out like, oh my God, are you violent? Like, no. Let the kid talk. Less talking, less directing from the parent point. More open-hearted, open-minded spaces where you create the ability for them to tell you what they really think. This is so good. This is such good advice because... I can see as the parent, we've been around longer, we've lived longer, we have more life experience. We may want to jump in and just fix the problem, tell them what to do. But you're absolutely right. It sounds so much better to give them a chance to think for themselves. Yes. 
and it's more loving. Here's the thing. When we jump in, it's our discomfort and fear that is driving our behavior. If we were to be honest with ourselves and say, is it in the highest and the best of my 10 year old for me to tell them what to do at every turn? You, we all know the answer is no, it isn't. And if the kid continues to think that punching Billy is the answer, you go, yeah, listen, we don't do that in this family. No punching, we're not doing that. So <laughs> that's off the table. All right, get creative, come up with something else. Like, again, we don't need to shame them, but we're not gonna let them do that either, right? So I think that there's a lot of fear that parents have. And I think we have to remember that through making mistakes and correcting those mistakes, like everyone, even children, they have the right to succeed or fail, to thrive or flail, right? Sometimes we gotta flail around to figure something out. And if no one lets us, then you have these kids going into adulthood and they are completely ill-equipped to be grown-ups. And then the parents of the adult children are like, what the hell is wrong? Why don't you know how to live? Hi, you never let them. You did everything. It's true, you give them a gift. If you can teach them the skill to problem solve, you'll take them so much further in life than doing for them. Right, but we also have to accept the fact that when we continue to parent long after it's appropriate, that is for us. That's not for them. That is, I want to center myself in your life. I want you to be centered on me. This is like the families where, let's say for the holidays, whether it's Christmas or Hanukkah, they're like, I had a client whose mother-in-law insisted that all of the siblings and all of their families go home to the family, meaning her husband's childhood home, on Christmas, like the highest holiday of the year, you know, for, for many people are the most celebrated. And finally, after a couple of years of therapy, my client was like, I want to spend Christmas in my own effing house. Like, I'm so done with the matching pajamas with the family of origin with my husband. Like, I'm not doing it. And she, <laughs> sa she said, you know, she's like, I'm not. So you can tell, tell your parents, we'll come home a month later. Maybe we can plan that with your siblings. But I'm, she's like, I'm no longer putting up a Christmas tree only to pretend that Santa Claus only goes to grandma's house. Like, I'm not doing it. I don't want to. And that mother who just can't let it go, the matriarchal, her, her place in the center, it's so selfish and self-absorbed. There's a beautiful, um, in the book, The Prophet, that was written, I think, in 1928, there's a beautiful um, poem about children and child rearing, and it basically refers to the parents as like, we are the bows and the children are the arrows, right? And our job is to help them go far. And like really grasping, you do not own your children. It is an honor for you to guide them during the years that you have them to do that. But you don't own them. And that's important. Doesn't mean you can't be close but we've got to respect their right to be autonomous. 